What is the cutest thing on the world? Is it this funny little deer or this tiny duck? Is it this baby? No, babies are disgusting. Perhaps it could be this capybara taking a bath. Ah, uh, yeah, maybe. <clears throat> moving on. As a scientist who bases 100% of his research within the 2008 life simulation game Spore, I theorize that by creating the cutest creature possible, I might just be able to take over the world through adorableness alone. The question was, where did I start? Spore is such a complex game, and there was just too many options. But, upon searching through the default menus of Spore's Creature Creator, I think I found the perfect test subject. Cuter than a button, and as charming as can be, it was a beautiful little elephant. So the experiment was underway, and after spawning into the world with my elephants, who for some reason rose up out of the ocean, I went about setting up a base on land. If I was going to be as cute as possible, the first thing I needed to do was find some new cute body parts to add to this already adorable canvas. Ah, perfect, here was a fossil straight away. Oh, I'm not too sure what that is, but maybe I could use it as some sort of tail? With this in mind, I began to head back to my nest, but hang on, there was something in the way. A small plum was holding onto my elephant's foot. I couldn't move. I tried shaking him off by doing a 360 maneuver, but even then, the plum would not give up, and it blocked me off at every twist and turn. Thankfully, the other elephants came to my rescue, and for now, the plum ran away. This meant it was time to get down to business. I entered the creature creator and deliberated about where to put this new body part I had found. Hmm, I'm not too sure about this. Maybe I should try a few other options instead, such as, uh, how about this moustache? But then I realised this was the worst idea I had ever had. I had come to the realisation that this elephant was already perfect. And, with that, it was about time to get started on the real adventure. <clears throat> uh, this, this is the part where I do the story. Stinky was the most adorable little elephant around. She was as cute as cute could be, although she would never say it herself as she was very humble and really modest and, and just a nice sort all round. Stinky had been having a very ordinary day. That is, until she had a rather peculiar run-in with a plum. The plum had seemed to want to get her attention for some reason, and, being the inquisitive sort, Stinky decided to find out what all the commotion was about. She headed to the plum's nest, and they began to talk. The plums said that Stinky was the most beautiful creature they had ever seen. As plums, the rest of the world rather looked down upon them, and they were hoping they could acquire her talents in a rather ambitious mission. If such a charming elephant like herself could travel around with them as a sort of ambassador, the plums were sure that people would begin to see them in a more positive light. And maybe, eventually, they could even conquer the world by spreading love and peace and friendship and collusion and friendship. In return, the plums would... well, they hadn't quite figured that part out yet. But, not being very good at negotiating, Stinky immediately agreed, and a new alliance was formed. Together, the new plum promotional team headed out, and Stinky was looking forward to her first day in her new role as PR representative. The PR, of course, standing for plum reputation. It was her job to use her cuteness to bring the plums up the social hierarchy, and they began by heading around the neighborhood, coming first across a group of koi carp. The koi carp were more than happy to listen to Stinky's impassioned yet adorable speech. And, by the time she was finished, they would have given her a round of applause if only they had the arms to do so. Next, the team moved on to a group of bird-shaped creatures, who, like the carp, were equally won over by Stinky's charm and charisma. It was all going so well, until... Ooh, what the hell were these? The third creatures they bumped into were a much tougher crowd. They stood there grimacing. How was Stinky supposed to charm a creature that was so inherently uncharming? Maybe this task was going to be a bit harder than Stinky had first thought. Thankfully, just around the corner, help was at hand, in the form of a group of penguins. The leader of the penguins, Peter, told Stinky that he dreamed of becoming a pirate, and that he would trade information on how to be charming as long as she joined his pirate crew. 
Stinky was already part of the Plum promotional team. She did, however, have a friend who was interested in pirates, and she told Peter she would refer him via email address within 7 to 10 business days. Of course, Stinky didn't know what emails were, but she knew that that was something that a PR representative would probably say. This was good enough for Peter, and he proceeded to instruct her on a new charming technique. The key to being charming, according to Peter, was to do a funny little dance. In Peter's words, as long as Stinky, quote unquote, shook her behind like it was full of salt and pepper, she was sure to win anyone over. That seems like good advice, thought Stinky, and she continued onwards with a spring in her step, ready to try out her new technique. She captivated a group of hedgehogs by performing an adorable salsa. Then, she charmed a group of trout by bobbing up and down whilst whistling a delightful tune. The plums couldn't believe their luck, to think they had managed to bag such a talented ambassador. But Stinky was beginning to have second thoughts. Things were all moving a bit too fast. She wanted to help the plums, sure, but what was this all for? To rule the world through cuteness? When she thought about it, Stinky didn't really want world dominance. She just wanted, well, in truth, Stinky had always just wanted to be loved. Stinky explained this to the plums, whilst emphasising heavily that she very much only thought of them in a professional capacity. Thankfully, the plums were very understanding, and in fact, this doubled up perfectly as a way for them to pay Stinky back. How about, whilst parading around spreading the good word about plum kind, they would also try to find Stinky a date? Stinky agreed, and the campaign continued full steam ahead. But around these parts, dating options were few and far between. How about these lobsters? No, too weird and spiky, and they didn't seem to like her much anyway. What about these toucans? They might be okay, but every time Stinky got near one of them, it flew away. What was going on? Stinky had no problem with charm when it came to public relations, but as soon as it came to finding love, everyone was avoiding her like the plague. It was upon finding a nest of micro-pigs that the issue became clear as day. Stinky was just too small. If these were micro-pigs, then that meant Stinky must be a micro-elephant. This wasn't good, as even Stinky knew that scientifically, taller people are more attractive. She decided to ask the micro-pigs for advice. As small creatures themselves, the pigs were very well versed on this subject. According to them, the only natural way to get taller in real life was to inhale a substance known as copium. But their advice was what she could try doing instead is to stand on top of something high up to make herself seem taller. This gave Stinky a genius idea. Okay, if she could just jump on top of here and then... Oh, oh no, that's not quite right. Oh god, stop moving. Stand still, stand still. Stinky's idea was for her and another elephant to stack themselves, so together they would have the presence of one big elephant. Stinky tried again, this time performing some spectacular front flips to try and lever herself on top of her friend. For a moment, it seemed as if it was working, but then her friend began to bounce up and down, and the whole thing was ruined. Well, that didn't go very well, and Stinky was feeling rather hopeless. Perhaps she was destined to be alone forever. She wandered around feeling dejected. So dejected, in fact, that she didn't even notice the huge geezer springing out of the ground in front of her. And look out, Stinky! You're about to... Oh, you're about to... <gasps> she was launched high, high into the air. And would you believe it? From way up in the clouds, she spotted him. The one. The very one she had been dreaming of. Upon hitting the ground with a thud, she rushed over, hoping and praying that what she had seen wasn't merely a figment of her imagination. But no, there he was, the most handsome little elephant she had ever seen. Small Paul. Their eyes met and Stinky felt her heart melt into her stomach. They were perfect for each other, really, truly perfect. Stinky thanked the plums for all they had done for her, and bid them a fond farewell. It was time to go on her first ever date. The next few days were a dream. Her and Paul spent every waking hour frolicking in the fields, splashing about in the water, and firing themselves up into the air on the geezer near which they had first met. Stinky spent hours showing small Paul her front-flipping skills, 
and afterwards they would go and visit the giant Toucan, just to annoy it and run away again in fits of laughter. Ah, it was such fun. Stinky thought she could spend her whole life at Small Paul's side. But then, off in the distance, uh-oh, who was this? p p p p poachers Very suddenly, a bunch of armed men came charging out of the wilderness. The air was split by loud banging noises as they fired their shotguns without hesitation. Stinky and Small Paul ran as fast as their tiny legs would carry them, but the poachers were too many and too fast. Seeing how dangerous the situation was getting, Small Paul bravely turned around and went to face the poachers head on. It was a noble sacrifice and a testament to how valiant Small Paul really was. Before she knew it, Stinky was separated from him, and, in the chaos, they lost each other. Stinky too turned around and rushed in, but by this point, Paul was nowhere to be seen. She heard the rev of engines behind her, and some sort of cart pulled away, noises of struggle coming from inside. Paul! She cried out in desperation. Stinky was more determined than ever before. She would reach him, no matter what. They had just found each other. It was too soon for it all to go so wrong. And then, oof, a stray shotgun hit her on the back of the head. She was knocked unconscious, and everything went dark. Stinky awoke to find she was trapped inside of a large metal cage. Where was she? Looking out through the bars, she saw what seemed to be some kind of hunting camp. It all came flooding back to her. The poachers! Paul had been taken! There was no time to lose. She had to find a way out of this place. Thankfully, it seems the poachers hadn't quite accounted for just how small of an elephant Stinky really was. And her cage was so big that she could in fact just walk out of it. Well, that was easy. But Stinky wasn't out of danger just yet. She was still surrounded by enemies on all sides. And, before they could notice she was gone, she would have to make a move. As stealthy as possible, Stinky ran across the encampment to the front gates. Sadly, this time, there was no gap quite big enough for her to fit through. It was no good. Stinky turned and searched around desperately for another way out. But, in the process, she was spotted. The alarm was raised, and a huge chase scene began. Poachers started to fire their muskets left, right, and center. Stinky had to weave in between a barrage of shells. It was pandemonium. Things were looking bleak. One tenacious poacher was hot on her tail, and it appeared she was going to be caught again until... There, right in the corner of the camp, was a small hole in the wall. Stinky ducked through it and out to the other side. Perfect. The poachers were too big to follow, and Stinky was free. After thinking for a while about the underwhelming structural integrity of the poacher's base, Stinky remembered she was in a hurry. Jumping into action, she circumnavigated the walls as quickly as possible, but was just agonizingly moments too late. The poacher's wagon careered off towards the horizon, small Paul's distant trumpets fading away as it went. This wasn't over. Stinky would follow that wagon to the ends of the earth if she had to. And, more determined than ever, she made the decision to set out on what was to be a very long journey. Days and days passed as Stinky ventured onwards across all manner of terrain. She travelled across sweltering hot deserts, dense forests filled with vicious mushroom creatures, wild savannas, dark mires, and barren wastelands. Stinky was unwavering. She would not rest until she saw Paul's adorable little face again. And so, she kept going, and going, and going, until she reached a bit of an impasse. A giant mountain stretched up into the sky before her. Stinky tried her best to climb it, but the surface was much too steep for her tiny short legs. After tumbling all the way back down to the bottom, it was clear she was going to have to bite the bullet and go around. But, as she made to do so, there it was. The poacher's wagon zoomed past her once again. Thank goodness, after all these days of running, Stinky might finally have caught up. However, just as soon as it had appeared, the wagon passed through another large gate and was concealed behind a gigantic wall of ice. As the gate swung shut, Stinky was left with nowhere to go. 
She had expected to hit a couple of walls on her journey, but not literally. <laughs> she now had two choices. Climb over a mountain she couldn't climb, or break through a wall she couldn't break. Was that it then? Was the chase over? But just as she was beginning to fall into despair, Stinky came across a nest of mountain goats. The goats were quite confused as to what an elephant was doing in such a cold and unforgiving place. Stinky explained the whole story, and, taking pity on her, the goats agreed to lead Stinky to a secret mountain pass that only they knew about. This was perfect, Stinky thought as she and the goats scooted their way down the side of a hill on their bums. In her experience, secret pass was essentially another way of saying shortcut, meaning Stinky could reach the other side of the mountain before the poacher's wagon, and then think of a way to save small Paul. For the first time in a while, Stinky was feeling a little optimistic. That is, until she reached the secret pass, and all hopes were immediately dashed. When Stinky had imagined a secret pass, what she hadn't been thinking of was a few planks of wood precariously perched on the side of a cliff. Unfortunately, according to the goats, this was the only way up. And, with that, Stinky began her ascent. She inched her way along the broken walkways, trying her very best not to fall over the edge. As the boards creaked under her feet, and the wind howled in her ears, she considered turning back. But no, small Paul was waiting for her. She could not let him down. Eventually, she reached a section which was completely unpaved, and she had to perform a series of bunny hops to make any progress at all. After a monumental effort, she could at last see the mountain's peak, and, stepping over the final ridge, she stood and gazed out at the snowy plateau before her. To Stinky's surprise, immediately in front of her was some sort of campfire. Hold on, did this mean that other people had made it up here before her, or did it perhaps belong to the goats? Even more pressing, why was the ground littered with so many skeletons? Upon turning around, all of Stinky's questions were answered. Stood behind her was a giant yeti. It was the size of a small building, maybe even taller. And what's more, it was coming straight towards her. Oh god, run! Run, Stinky! Run for your life! With one giant leap, Stinky sprang back over the side of the mountain, and tumbled all the way down to the very, very bottom again. Well, something tells me the giant wall of ice may have been the better option after all, and, having been absolutely scared out of her wits, Stinky was of the same opinion. Whatever was behind that wall had to be better than the prospect of being eaten by a yeti, or so she thought. But, as she approached the large wooden gate, what she saw on the other side was not all that much better. It was a whole settlement of mountain bandits. Now it all made sense. Everybody knows that bandits and poachers are practically best friends. Hence the poacher's wagon was granted safe passage around the mountain. Stinky didn't fancy her chances at bartering the same kind of deal. She was going to have to try and sneak through instead. And, plucking up all of her courage, she took a running jump and managed to kind of glitch herself through the gate. Now that she was in, the pressure was on. Her first move was to shuffle her way up a nearby tent, allowing her to scout out the rest of the settlement. From up on a chimney, she thought she spotted something quite strange. It was another huge metal cage, similar to the one she had previously been captured in. Probably an offering from the poachers. Stinky had to help whoever was inside. She snuck her way across the courtyard, using the doorways of nearby buildings for cover. Eventually, she made it across to the cage, and, would you believe it, inside was what seemed to be a baby yeti. Well, to be honest, after her previous experience, Stinky wasn't much fond of yetis, but she knew as well as anyone now how it felt to be captured and locked up. What if that other yeti up on the mountain was his father or something? Perhaps he was up there looking for him, worried sick. Oh fine, Stinky would save the yeti. She informed the baby yeti that the cage he was in was in fact useless, and that if he wanted to get out, all he had to do was walk between the huge gap in the bars. With a little encouragement, the yeti did just that, and now all they had to do was tiptoe back to the entrance and escape. This did not go to plan, as they were immediately spotted by a bandit, and the chase was once again on. Stinky was able to slip back out of the gate with an incredibly impressive flip. 
Haha, take that you stupid bandit. Oh, no, fair point, you can jump too. <laughs> this would have been bad news, but upon trying to get back inside the village, the bandit somehow managed to get himself lodged inside of a pillar. And now that he wasn't a threat anymore, with a bit of jiggery pokery, the baby yeti wormed his way free and Stinky led him back to his mountain home. They headed up the creaky wooden path, and once they reached the top, the baby yeti and his father were reunited. In return for Stinky's heroics, the yeti offered her a favour, for he could see far and wide from the top of his mountain, and as a result, he had spotted exactly where the poachers had driven off to. Stinky asked the yeti to guide her, and, with great joy, he obliged. So they set out travelling once more. Sure, it had been an unconventional journey so far, but she and Paul would be together again soon. She just knew it. Yes, Stinky was on her way. Meanwhile, small Paul found himself on a high platform, surrounded by a crowd of chanting spectators. Rich and twisted men from afar had come to this coliseum carrying vast swathes of gold. At that moment, Paul's number was called. The auctioneer raised his gavel, and the bidding war began. Ten pounds, twenty pounds, twenty-one pounds and fifty-seven pence. Stinky could hear bidders shouting various prices from inside. But before she could reach the auction, she was stopped at the gate by an intimidating guard. It's a six pound fifty entry fee, please. Six pound fifty as an entry fee? Stinky couldn't believe it. What a rip-off. This was bad news. Stinky didn't have a single penny to her name. And if she couldn't even afford to get inside the venue, there was no chance of entering the auction and buying Paul back. She desperately needed to find some way to make bucket loads of money. But how could a small elephant such as her compete with a crowd of infinitely wealthy individuals, especially on this short notice? Maybe a garage sale? Or perhaps investing in cryptocurrency would be a good idea. But just as she began fretting, a huge bell rang from inside the Colosseum, followed by a shout for LUNCH BREAK! All of a sudden, the crowds of people began to move, and within a moment's time, a great gathering was forming around a large steaming cauldron of soup. That was it! Stinky would enter the soup market! Everybody loved soup. If she could set up her own soup delivery business, she was sure to make a small fortune. To enter the world of takeaway cuisine, however, she was going to need some help. And for this, she returned to her old trusty companions, the group of mountain goats. Together, they came to an agreement. In return for future ownership of the business, the goats would perform the role of delivery drivers. Stinky had a few questions about the design of their delivery vehicles, but together, they were able to establish a new base of operations, and the money-making could begin. Only, there was one fundamental question that still remained. Where did soup even come from? The answer was right in front of them, as, just a few feet away, a strange vent of steam rose out of the ground and into the air. This geezer of sorts was in fact soup in gas form, a telltale sign that somewhere below the soil was a soup cavern. Preparing to venture deep into the earth's core, the goats built supports around the vent, and with that, Stinky took the plunge into the unknown. She dropped down into a pool of spooky green water. In an instant, an array of pungent smells filled her trunk. <laughs> Tomato and basil? <laughs> Minestrone? <laughs> Leek and potato? This really must be the place! With much excitement, she hurried onwards into the cave. But before she could get too ahead of herself, something unexpected stopped her dead in her tracks. In the center of the cavern, standing tall, was a giant soup dragon. Stinky began to shake with terror, but thankfully, soup dragons are a very friendly species. And as soon as the two of them began to chat, they talked for hours. 
Conversations varied between the legitimacy of clam chowder to the pros and cons of soups versus stews. But eventually, Stinky inquired about a potential deal. The soup dragon said that a bunch of aggressive mushrooms had stolen her breakfast. Stinky struggled to see how this was at all relevant, but she assumes that if she could steal the dragon's breakfast back, it might be willing to go into business. Stinky explored the surroundings of the cave, until she came across a forest of mushrooms, some of which, as described, were definitely the aggressive sort. In amongst them, Stinky spotted some sort of dish, but before she could reach it, the angry mushrooms descended on her, and a fight broke out. After running around in a state of hysterics, somewhere amongst the fray, Stinky was able to grab the wooden bowl. Lo and behold, it was filled to the brim with fried eggs. And without wasting a second, Stinky left the mushrooms in her dust and stomped her way back over to the soup dragon's burrow. With her breakfast returned, the dragon was over the moon, and Stinky was given jurisdiction of all soup caverns in the surrounding area. With this, the goat delivery service got to work, and as they claimed soup geezer after soup geezer, the money began to roll in. Unfortunately, due to this success, word began to get around, and other delivery companies started to move into the area. Before Stinky knew it, there was the Yellow Nation, a group of goats who worked for a delivery service known as Ubar Eats, the Brown Nation, who worked for Just Bleat, and the Lavender Nation, who worked for Deliver Moo, a subsidiary company run by a group of cows. This wasn't fair. It was Stinky who made the deal with the Soup Dragon, and now competition was leeching off her hard work. If Stinky's business was going to make enough to buy Paul back, they had to find some advantage over the rest of the market. And that's when she noticed a small plume of soup gas rising out of the middle of the sea. The goats got to work on a wooden goat boat, and together they sailed out across the waves towards their beacon of hope. Upon reaching the site though, they were shocked to discover an underwater cave, which, upon venturing into it, was icy and cold. This was home to yet another soup dragon, but it was just as friendly as the previous, only instead of breakfast this time, this soup dragon was searching for something a bit more valuable. You see, the blue soup dragon had been planning on marrying the green soup dragon, only she couldn't find anything to use as a wedding ring. So, Stinky once again set out to explore the deepest corners of the cavern. And, after a good route around, she spotted something twinkling off in the distance. It was a huge pile of gemstones, almost too dazzling for her beady little eyes. One of these would do just perfect, and, as simple as that, a deal was struck with the blue soup dragon for distribution of soup across all of the seven seas. Now, Stinky's soup empire was really beginning to grow, but to be number one, Stinky would have to ensure that people came to her company for soup over anyone else's. How does one seize a monopoly on soup as a product? Well, the plan was simple. Instead of competing with all of the different companies around her, Stinky would just buy them all out and make them work for her. It was genius, and with that, she and the goats began to set up trade routes with surrounding nations. The vehicles the goats had created didn't really lend themselves towards soup transportation, so instead they suspended the soup above them in big helium balloons. This did create a side effect whereby everyone who ate the soup would temporarily have a high-pitched voice, but that didn't stop the brown nation or the lavender nation from joining the side, especially once Stinky sweetened the deal a little bit. Although buying out these other companies was eating significantly into Stinky's auction budget, it did mean she now had access to even more soup geezers. So long as she was able to claim these new soup deposits, her business would be even more profitable. But oh no, this was terrible news. Something sinister was blocking the way. It couldn't be. It was a giant poacher. Those damn poachers. First they trap her in a cage, then they steal her boyfriend, and now they were meddling with her hot air balloon based soup empire. Stinky tried sending a bunch of goat vehicles to deal with the problem, but the giant poacher was far too powerful. Her delivery goats may have been shrewd businessmen, but fighters they were not. This problem needed a more military approach, and for that, she would have to get the Pink Nation on side. 
To reach the Pink Nation though, they would need to cross to a new continent. And so, refashioning a bunch of soup hot air balloons, the Mountain Goats engineered a fleet of Zeppelins. Then it was just a case of drifting over, offering the Pink Nation a metric ton of soup, and then subsequently buying out their entire city. The time had come to weaponize, and the Mountain Goats did so in genius fashion, by replacing the horns on their goat zeppelins with two massive cannons. Now composed of an armada of destructive super blimps, the goat army flew back across the ocean to engage in an epic battle. They circled the giant poacher like a swarm of bees, only they weren't bees at all, they were still very much goats. Hard-working, service industry, soup-delivering goats, put in control of weapons of mass destruction, what could possibly go wrong? The poacher fought back, picking airships out of the sky one by one with his giant blunderbust. But the strength of the goat army was unmatched, and eventually, the ground shook as the giant poacher fell to his knees with a mighty boom. The monster may have been defeated, but this was no time to celebrate. With great haste, Stinky jumped from her zeppelin and down into the soup cavern below. It was just as she suspected, the battle was not over. Up ahead, she could see yet more poachers. They were attempting to capture a soup dragon. How much lower can you get? Showing enormous courage, Stinky charged in by herself. She may not have been strong enough on her own, but her bravery was an inspiration. And, before she knew it, her entire mountain goat staff was charging in to back her up. Together, they fought valiantly. And, when the dust settled, the soup dragon was saved. As a way of giving thanks, Stinky was once again granted ownership over the Soup Dragon's territory. And as it just so happened, this now meant she owned, and I'm not exaggerating here, every last drop of soup in the world! Quite the accolade. And, with such an impressive chokehold on the soup industry, the money began to rake in. £50,000, then £60,000, then the funny number, and with a monumental 100,000 spore bucks in the bank, Stinky knew it was over. She headed back to the Colosseum, where surprisingly the auction was still going on. Thankfully, the bidding had only been increasing by 10 pence per time, and paired with hourly lunch breaks, bidding wars in this Colosseum would often last weeks if not years. Stinky strode in with all of the confidence of a rich noblewoman. The money had definitely already started to go to her head. It was therefore best that she got rid of it, and she handed over all 100,000 in the form of a novelty-sized giant golden coin. The auctioneer slammed his gavel down to the floor. Even he knew that no man or woman present could match such a tremendous sum. It was only now that Stinky was hit with a sense of overwhelming joy. She and Paul set eyes upon each other as free elephants for the first time in what felt like forever, and she was reminded just why she fell for those dreamy, dreamy, cold, black, emotionless eyes. Their journey had not been easy, but now they stood at one another's side, none of that seemed to matter. The most important thing was that they were trotting out of here with the person they loved most in the whole entire world. For Stinky and Small Paul, this was the start of a lifetime together. One they were sure would be happy. Or it would have been, but for one thing. In her haste to win Small Paul's auction, Stinky had forgotten to pay the £6.50 entry fee, a crime punishable among mountain bandits by death. Or much worse. If only she and Paul hadn't been so smitten by each other, they may have overheard the guard on the way out making a mysterious phone call and muttering, Bring me the most dangerous bounty hunter in the world. This is a job for Dimitri the Duck. I am the leader of a crime syndicate. Don't question why I'm announcing this publicly on YouTube, just, just trust me. That's right, this whole time I have been a mafia boss. But right now, I have a problem. I am a little short-staffed, and I find myself needing a new hitman. My previous hitman was defeated by a bunch of humanoid pairs. This time, I need someone with ingenuity, a bounty hunter with a real passion for the kill, someone who has unbelievable amounts of stealth. And to find this hitman, what better place to turn to than the classic video game Hitman World of Assassination? No, I'm just kidding, the 2008 life simulation game, Spore. 
by utilizing the scientific potential of Spore's creature creator, I should be able to sift through an infinite amount of options to eventually land on the perfect specimen. For example, how about this ostrich? No, too tall. His head would poke out when he was trying to hide behind things. In that case, what about this shrimp? No, this one is too small. Perhaps I could use this pickle? No, too pickled. It seems this would be harder than I first thought. But, just as I was about to give up, I stumbled upon the perfect candidate. A duck! This was genius! What better creature to make a sneaky assassin out of than an animal that's name literally means to dodge out of the way of things? My ducks were going to duck and weave their way to the very top of the bounty hunting world, making me and my crime syndicate stacks of money, whilst also taking out all of our competition. Without further ado then, I found myself a planet, and my troop of ducks raced into action. Oh, no wait, one of them is a bit stuck. Come on little duck, come on, you can do it, come on. There we go, okay. <clears throat> Right, uh, where was I? Right, men, welcome to Hitman Training School. By the end of this, I will have turned each one of you into a bloodthirsty psychopath, but right now you are pretty cute, to be fair, you are pretty cute. Step forward, candidate number one. I shall christen you Dimitri, and you will be the most adorable mass murderer in the whole world. Having chosen my test subject, it was time to find Dimitri his very first target. Hitmen don't usually go around searching for people to kill, that's more sort of a serial killer thing, but Dimitri had to start somewhere, and before long, he came across a nest of snails. Go on then, Dimitri, take them out. But not really knowing anything about assassination, Dimitri walked right up to the snails in broad daylight and began to peck one with his beak. Unsurprisingly, this was not very effective. There was no element of surprise, no secrecy, and Dimitri was swiftly defeated. So, not the best of starts. In his first mission, my duck had been beaten up by a garden snail. I may have made a terrible mistake. Dimitri was obviously not very strong, so it was clear that if he was going to be even remotely successful as a hitman, he would need some way to sneak up on his opponents and take them out before they even realized he was there. In pursuit of this, I fitted him out with a very important accessory. A piece of grass. Although it might look stupid, in Spore, this blade of grass contains the ability of sneak. Don't ask me how it works, but fashioning the grass into a sort of tail, Dimitri could now just disappear on command. Perfect. Those snails quite literally wouldn't know what had hit them, and Dimitri headed back over to resume his mission. This time, he was able to sneak around the back undetected, and, waiting patiently for the opportune moment, all of a sudden, he struck. He sprung into the air, performing some sort of death from above type maneuver, and hitting the snail with a series of devastating blows. In mere moments, the target had been terminated, and Dimitri now had one confirmed kill. This was great progress, really great progress, Dimitri, and I was eager to test out his new abilities on other more challenging targets. First, Dimitri infiltrated a nest of a bunch of shrimps, then taking them out one by one, and afterwards treating himself to a little snack. Then Dimitri set about doing the same to a bunch of snakes. And, by the time he returned home from his training, the rest of the ducks had been training as well, and a proper bounty hunting association had been formed. Dimitri took a blood pact and signed a bunch of contracts through the medium of dance. Of course, he didn't bother to read any of the terms and conditions, but he was sure it would be fine. And, with that, he was given his very first official hitman job. Dimitri was to go and meet the client, an incredibly wealthy hedgehog from next door. According to the hedgehog, a bunch of bananas had moved into the neighborhood and were interfering with his business of harvesting body parts. Ooh, Jesus, should we really be helping this guy, Dimitri? But the money was too good to turn down, and Dimitri soon arrived at the banana's base. He wasted no time going into sneak mode, and he began to make his approach. But before he could get too close, oh god no, he'd been spotted. The bananas descended upon him in an instant, and it was only thanks to his training in speed and agility that he narrowly escaped with his life. It seems the bananas were more astute than any creature he'd come across before. And so, to even get close to them, he was going to have to upgrade his sneak ability. But how, you might be wondering, can you get any stealthier than a piece of grass? One word, leaf. 
Now that Dimitri was wearing a leaf on his head, he was practically unstoppable. His camouflage was so good that upon returning to the banana's base, they had no idea where he was. This allowed him and his bounty hunting associate to charge in, catch the bananas by surprise, and viciously peck them all to death one after another. Looks like these bananas aren't so ripe anymore, said Dimitri. It sounded cooler in his head. He, he was working on his post-kill one-liners. With their mission a major success, they returned to the hedgehogs, who gave them a really good review on the Hitman review app, RipAdvisor. And, all of a sudden, business for the Duck Bounty Hunting Association was booming. So much so that Dimitri came straight out of one job and into the next. His clients this time were a group of poachers. Dimitri wasn't too sure whether he should be working with poachers, as he was a duck, an animal which gets poached all the time. Unfortunately, if he refused, they threatened to feed him to a giant poacher, so he didn't really have much choice. Thankfully, their target this time was a group of micro-pigs. This should be easy then, I mean, pigs are well known for being stupid. In his overconfidence though, Dimitri got too close and he was immediately spotted. He went to make a retreat, but as if things couldn't get any worse, the giant poacher was right behind him. He was then picked up by the huge creature, tossed through the air, and then chased all the way back to Bounty Hunting HQ. Goodness me, that was terrifying. This was a mission he could not afford to fail. Because of this, Dimitri decided to upgrade his sneak ability again, by getting himself a twig. Now he wasn't just disguising himself as a leaf, but as a whole tree branch. It was genius. Anyone who saw him would just think he was a stick. And this proved to be true, as when he returned to the micro pig's nest, they paid no attention to him, and he was able to tiptoe around undetected. Then, when the timing was right, he and the other ducks charged in as they always did and took out their targets with swift efficiency. With the micro pigs defeated, the poachers were overjoyed, and they were so impressed with Dimitri's excellent work that they upgraded his sneak ability even further by removing his twig and adorning him with a beautiful flowery hat. This would have been payment enough, but the poachers were keen to buy Dimitri's services again. It seemed they had a lot of enemies that they needed to get rid of. This time, Dimitri's job was more specific. He was to search for an intergalactic traveller by the name of Fruitius Maximus. Apparently, Fruitius was a pear, a race of sentient fruit known for being incredibly tough. With this in mind, the poachers gifted Dimitri his very own sniper rifle. That's right, he had a gun now. I don't think I can stress this enough. He was now a duck with a gun. Dimitri thought it wise to test out his new weapon before embarking on this dangerous mission. So he found himself a nice vantage point overlooking a nest of mushrooms. And with that, he began to let loose. Oh my god, this thing was ridiculous. It was just one shot, one kill. Dimitri was a little overpowered now to say the least, and he was such a well-trained assassin at this point that he was hitting every shot with 100% accuracy. Not to mention the fact he didn't even have arms. After enough target practice, Dimitri decided it was time for the real deal. He darted his way through the trees until he spotted Fruitius Maximus' encampment up ahead. Using the full extent of the new flower on top of his head, Dimitri did what he always did and disappeared into thin air. He snuck his way through until he was so close he could smell the fruity scent of pears all around him. He loaded his gun and prepared to shoot. Arguably, Dimitri didn't need to get this close because he was using a sniper rifle. But in the end, it didn't really matter anyway. Because as he stared deep into Fruitius Maximus's beautiful pear eyes, he was suddenly struck by a deep sense of humanity. What was Dimitri doing? Was he really a stone cold killer? These pears had done nothing to him. So why was he going along with all of this? He was a founding member of the Duck Bounty Hunters Association, sure. But as he stood there and thought about the things he had done up until now, the things he had done with these blood-stained wings of his, he felt a great sense of shame. That was it. He would not do it. He would be a slave to the organization no more. He would just leave Fruitius Maximus alone, run away, and go live a more fulfilling life. I mean, what were they gonna do? It's not like they would just hunt him down or anything. But the organization doesn't forget, and they certainly don't tolerate traitors. What was that sound? It was getting louder. Oh goodness, Dimitri, look behind you. Run, Dimitri, run! All of a sudden, he was swamped in waves and waves of duck mercenaries. They flung themselves up and over him, encircling him in a huge crowd and... 
No, Dimitri. Oh, God, this is horrible. My child. My poor, sweet, sweet boy. Has anyone ever thought that the world isn't wide enough? No? D just me? Show of hands, maybe? <laughs> if we look back throughout history, it is often the widest people that have been the most successful. Genghis Khan, Father Christmas, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, and Minecraft Steve. What would happen then if I created a new species that was as wide as possible? Would it be the most powerful creature in existence, or would it get stuck walking through doorways? To find out, I would be harnessing the most advanced scientific technology ever invented, the 2008 life simulation game Spore. Jumping straight into the game I came up with this. Yes, now that is one wide boy, a creature which could be described as swole or built different. Feeling I'd already reached perfection, I loaded into the game, established a base and began to set out on what I assumed would be an easy conquest. Oh. Why is he so boz eyed Oh well, never mind that, as I was saying, he's perfect, oh for god's sake, he's stuck on a bush. How am I supposed to conquer the world when I can't even defeat the native shrubbery? Plus, ah, uh, there's something very wrong with this specimen, because it should not be doing that. Look at it, that, that's messed up. In pursuit of newer, wider ideas then, I decided to explore the surrounding area, hoping for some inspiration. On my travels I bumped into something called a long boy. Ugh, kinda cringe. Why would you ever want to be long when you could be wide? Plus look, if I turn sideways I'm literally longer anyway. Who even made this creature? They should be ashamed of themselves. And a similar thought occurred to me when I came across a bunch of snakes. What is with these creatures? Surely this snake would be 10 times better if it was just rotated 90 degrees. Wait, that's a genius idea! And, at once, I began work on something majestic, a creature I like to call the Sideways Python. I think you'll agree this is a brilliant concept. You think it's just a normal snake from the front, but then, no wait, it's so much better. In its execution though, this was, well, a bit cursed. Some would say it was a tiny bit glitchy. I don't really know what they'd be talking about, because I mean, it looks just fine to me. Anyway, the main point was, I felt like I was on the right track. Think, Jude, is there anything else we can take inspiration from? What is the widest thing on the world right now? Something that spans in both directions for miles. <gasps> That's it! The Great Wall of China! I can't believe I didn't think of it yet! It's so obvious! The Great Wall of China is so wide, it spans literally a whole country! Unfortunately, the game's creature creator didn't really accommodate making ancient wonders, so I was sort of limited to making just one segment of the Great Wall of China. But that's okay because with a little bit of coordination, this will all work out. Okay guys, I'm just gonna need you to adopt a sort of line formation. To me now everyone, we need to work together here. For a split second, this was sort of working whilst my tribe of wide boys were standing still. But on the move, it was a completely different story. Guys, you're gonna have to keep up here because right now this isn't a moving wall. This is just a bunch of jigsaw pieces going for a walk. I was not living up to the name of the Great Wall, but having said that, this wide boy variation was showing great promise in other areas, particularly when it came to pushing. My creature could just push other species around and they could do absolutely nothing about it. This was it. This was how we were going to take over the world, one push at a time. I could push shrimps. I could push human beings. In fact, I bet I could even push this giant toucan over here without even breaking a sweat. Okay, or, or maybe not. We may have died, I will admit that, but all this tells me is we need to go even bigger. And so I did. No holding back. Goodbye, Great Wall of China. Away with all the intricate details and fancy brickwork. I would opt instead for one huge wedge. It was simple, yet elegant. Stupid, yet oh so powerful. And most importantly, it was wide. This was the specimen I'd been searching for, a creature of such gargantuan width that it didn't even notice those being pushed around in front of it. 
With this weird, oversized chicken nugget, I proceeded to trample all in my path, and the rest of creature stage was a breeze. I shoved and stomped and rammed my way to the very top of the animal kingdom, past bananas, past poachers, past elephants, past pears. Although the elephants and pears were kind of cute, so instead of pushing them, we just sort of span around in circles a bit. Anyway, I had mastered the game, but I wasn't done there. Oh no, no. I was going to create a dynasty. It was time to enter tribal stage, but to form a proper tribe, we desperately needed to increase our numbers. And so, the baby making montage began. Egg after egg popping out of the village hut through what I can only assume is uh, magic. I'm not quite sure how these things do make children otherwise, to be honest, but make children they did. And the population of my village grew and grew until wide boys covered nearly the entire screen. It was a sight to behold. So much chunkiness in one place. And in celebration, they all began to chant, wide boy, wide boy, wide boy, wide boy, wide boy. Boy, why, th this wasn't a cult though. I, I want to make that very clear. This is not a cult. <laughs> what an army I have amassed. Now go, my thick boys. Go and make the whole planet wide. The very earth shook as the widest armada you've ever seen charged over the fields to war. No other species could match them. It was like someone had emptied a bag of overpowered ready salted crisps over the battlefield. A swarm of broad soldiers pushing as one until any semblance of civilization was crushed before them. The surrounding villagers cowered in fear as one by one they heard a great rumbling on the horizon which held heralded their imminent demise. Nothing could stop my wide boys now, apart from mild hunger as it turns out. I mean, the queuing at mealtimes was just a nightmare. But my wide boys didn't need normal meals when they could merely devour the souls of their enemies in battle. With every village they consumed, they grew wider and wider. So wide, they had outgrown their little tribal settlement. I needed to make a city with wide cars and wide houses to accommodate them but they just didn't stop, getting wider and wider until even the sun was blocked from view. Wide Boy was as wide as the mountains he stood upon, so expansive he could walk across the ocean while still touching the ground, but hold on, Wide Boy, aren't you getting a little bit too tall? Oh goodness, this was bad. My Wide Boy wasn't just wide anymore, he was long as well. Nobody can be wide and long, that's just too OP. Stop, wide boy, you're going too far. I can't see past your ginormous body and oh god, I can barely see at all. All I can see is wide. My eyes are becoming wide. My brain is becoming wide. Everything is wide. How many times have I even said wide in this one video? Oh my god. Taking over the entire world is quite hard. I have tried many times using the 2008 life simulation game Spore to make the most powerful creature ever created. But up until now, the stars just haven't aligned. Sometimes my creature is strong, but not subtle enough. Other times my creature is incredibly stylish, but also absolutely brain dead. It feels as if I have all the ingredients, I just need some way to sandwich them all together into one wonderful dish. Wait, hang on, that was it! I would make a sandwich- no. No, just a plain old sandwich wouldn't do. I can't take over the world with a simple ham and cheese or an egg and cress. I needed something bigger, something that would make people's taste buds drool and knees tremble at the very same time. I am of course referring to the god of sandwiches, the burger. And so I set about creating my new world, Flavored Town, and jumped straight into Cell Stage, which arguably wasn't the best place to start because already I am in the sea and my burger is soggy. Okay, looking at what we started with here, there's a lot of work to do and oh god, I've already nearly died. Run, run away. Please mate with me. Mate with me immediately. You don't understand I'm about to be crushed. Phew. Right, let's all calm down and take a look at some of our options here. First and foremost, burgers don't have eyes so we can get rid of them straight away. And then I suppose we need a burger patty of sorts. So spikes, weird tentacles, flappy dorsal fins, poison. None of these are particularly screaming gourmet 
may. I guess I just have to make the bun for now. So, fattening my creature up into a general bun shape, I marveled at the wonderful sesame seed texture that Spore's cell stage provides. Mmm, yes, that looks delicious. Perfect, time to get on with the game then. Oh god no, we're blind. It turns out that one of the side effects of not having eyes is that you can't see. And I spent the rest of Cell Stage just drifting around, occasionally bumping into miscellaneous pieces of meat. Surprisingly, this tactic worked rather well. I guess there's a reason they call it the primordial soup. <laughs> Uh, my burger bun got bigger and bigger until, before I knew it, it was time to enter Creature Stage. The only issue was, having been playing Spore Braille Edition up to this point, I had failed to gather any new body parts. That's probably the shortest evolution graph I've ever seen. Bun evolved, and then never evolved again. It seemed we'd be embarking onto land as no more than a giant ball of bread. Still, at least I had my other giant balls of bread for company. Oh, no, wait. One of them is going the wrong way. The ocean calls to him. He's off to be a pirate. Of course, this wasn't the case. It's just that my species were currently rocking the Stevie Wonder build. Having no eyes when the world around you just became ten times more complicated is maybe not the best idea, so I quickly went and rectified the situation. Oh, I could see everything now. The beautiful turquoise sky, the rancid orange ground beneath my feet. Now that that was sorted, it was time to search for ways to turn my bun into a bona fide burger. As I mentioned before, it was my theory that with each ingredient we added to my species, he would become twice as strong. So, oh look, what was this? Aha, a creature claiming to be lettuce. It was a bit different to any lettuce I had ever seen before, but oh well. I chowed down on every last one of them, absorbing their souls and presumably trapping them inside an endless bread-filled afterlife. But on the plus side, I had my first ingredient, and with great anticipation, I hurried back to my nest, found a mate, who may I say is beautiful, god damn, and began to modify my bread bun to make it much more burgery. I did this by splitting the bun in two, and then placing tufts of grass, which was the closest thing I could find to lettuce, around his forehead. Of course, his insides are still bread at this current moment in time, so what I have made here is essentially a bread sandwich, but ignoring that for now, I already felt stronger. My creature had gained the ability of charm. Ooh, cower in fear everyone. Obviously, my work wasn't yet done, and I set out once again into the wide world, searching for more ingredients, eventually coming across what appeared to be a nest of cheese slices. Excellent, another component to add to my perfect being. Goodness, this whole evolving business is easier than I anticipated. There seems to just be a buffet of sentient food to absorb everywhere I look. Apples? Um, not massively useful in a burger, but I suppose it could be apple sauce or something. Toucans? Maybe useful as a kind of replacement chicken for a chicken burger, but oh god, ow! Why is it pecking me? Uh-oh, I forgot birds like to eat bread. Stop it! Shoo! Shoo! Go away! Right, note to self, stay away from birds, such as these penguins over here. Ah. Uh. Run! Run away! Well, I guess we search in the other direction. Let's see, what are these here? Puffins. Oh, for God's sake. Run! Run away! R run away! That is it. I have had enough of birds. I swear down, when I become powerful enough, I am wiping every last bird off the face of this earth. Now, come on, surely there's something I can use here. Strawberries? No. Tiny elephants? No. Ducks? No, that's a bird. I'm not even interacting with them. They can go and dip themselves in hoisin sauce or something for all I care. Toucans again. And this time it's a giant one. Leave me alone. I am but a humble loaf. I do not deserve this. Oh, God. Right. Soup dragons. Finally. A fellow chef. If anyone would know about food, it would have to be a soup dragon. And as these were red soup dragons, they informed me all about the benefits of tomatoes. Oh, of course, at last a good suggestion. Tomatoes are a staple of a good burger. So I went home, added my tomatoes, and now it felt like there was only one thing missing. The burger. The burger part of the burger. But as it turned out, I wouldn't have to wait much longer. As, just round the corner, past the remnants of a crashed alien spaceship, <laughs> looks like someone was desperate to go to the drive through Sorry, this looks like a serious crash. I should not be making light of this situation. Anyway, past the alien spaceship was a herd of cows. 
Please tell me they weren't right here this whole time. I mean, what a stroke of luck. The only issue being these cows were really rather strong. I mean, just look at those udders. Quaw, blimey. I almost feel like they're against terms of service. Thankfully, I was able to use my lettucey tomato-y charm to convince the cows to shave just a small bit of beef off to donate to our cause. And now that my burgers were big beefy boys, our conquest could begin. The rest of Creature Stage would be a breeze. I would just shoot around, beating up toucans wherever I went, soon to become the one true apex predator- oh. Oh no. I had run into a group of poachers. This was a problem I had not accounted for. I didn't realise there would be people in this game. And worst of all, based on the fact they were all carrying shotguns, they were probably Americans. <laughs> Bad news. As to an American, and I hope this isn't stereotyping, burgers are as important as the air they breathe. I had to do something quickly, or else my entire species would be eaten in a heartbeat. It was dawning on me that perhaps if I wanted to make it to the top of the food chain, I shouldn't have made my species so incredibly delicious. So, as my burgers completed creature stage, discovered fire, and cooked themselves to somewhere around medium rare, I came up with a plan. My burgers would start a restaurant. A restaurant? I thought you didn't want to be eaten. It's probably what you're thinking right now if you are stupid and dumb and sheltered. But you see, I think in the fifth dimension. Because what better way to avoid being eaten than serving other food for people to eat? Think of it as hiding in plain sight. We divert attention away from our deliciousness whilst also setting up a chain of restaurants that rake in billions and billions of money. The only question left to answer was what my restaurant would sell. And to me at least, the solution to this problem was obvious. Eggs. Scrambled, fried, poached, uh, benedicted. By mass producing all manner of egg recipes, I could not only set my successful chain in motion, but would also be removing all bird life from the planet before they even hatched. I could quite literally kill two birds with one stone. And so, my burgers got to work. I sent one brave missionary out into the wild to tame one of the local ducks, whilst carefully avoiding being pecked to death. This duck would be our personal egg machine. Whatever she pooped out, others would put in. Our egg-based empire started here. She's gone to sleep. Unbelievable. We'll never make progress at this rate, but then I realised that birds lay eggs regardless of whether they're tamed or not. So whilst our own duck was out of action, why not just steal eggs instead? We would become the Hamburglers, and our first mission was already underway. Although, truth be told, with their great big buns, my burgers were not the most stealthy creatures. I mean, he literally just walked straight up in broad daylight and started harvesting their young. And great, now he's being attacked. I just don't know what he expected. It was at this point that the Pink Village came into existence. Oh great, we've already got customers moving in next door and we don't even have any produce yet. Moreover, the ducks weren't too happy at the whole egg harvesting fiasco, so we would probably have to look elsewhere for creatures to tame. I don't know, did bears lay eggs? I didn't think they did, but there's an egg in their nest, so I guess we'll give it a go. Just don't tell the Pink Village where their food is coming from and I'm sure it'll all be okay. Hang on, the Pink Village already had some eggs of their own. This presented a wonderful opportunity for another bit of thievery. What if we could steal the eggs they already own, and then serve them their own food for profit? It was an opportunity too good to turn down. This time my Hamburglar made extra sure to conceal himself properly, and he made away with a huge sack full of goods. Haha, a great success, but what's this, there's a message coming in. The Pink Village dislikes your tribe. Damn it, they must have spotted us because we were blasting out Sneaky Snitch by Kevin MacLeod during the entire heist. Well, that was fine. We would win them over with our Egg Empire eventually anyway. And with that, it was time to get back to work. Now that I discovered basically any animal in this game has the ability to lay eggs, I could recruit just about anything. How about pear eggs? They sound tasty. With three pets in the farm, the supply of eggs was nearly endless. We were making food faster than my little burgers could gather it, and the stocks continued to go up and up until we had over a hundred meals prepared. We were just about ready to roll out to the masses. Pink Village, prepare yourselves. Oh, what's this? Another message is coming in. Raiders have been spotted. They plan to steal your food. <gasps> they weren't. The Pink Village were pulling a reverse robbery. Well, this just wouldn't stand. You can't just take things without people's permission. That's a crime. And it deserved to be punished. 
Yes, we would take back what was rightfully ours. The burgers were going to war. To battle. Charge, men. Charge. Ah, right, yeah, they do all have shotguns, don't they? I kind of forgot about that one. Well, on the plus side, at least they blew up their own base as well. I see this as a complete and total victory. Let's go back home and celebrate. And, oh, it seems in the time we were away, a few customers have arrived. Now, it is a bunch of ducks, but that's okay. Maybe they've come to call a truce? We'll serve anyone here at the egg restaurant. Even a filthy bird deserves a nice portion of scrambled eggs. Or two or three birds, or there appears to be quite a lot of birds coming this way actually. And they look pretty hungry actually, and something tells me that eggs might not be their first choice on the menu. Okay, we're doing this again, are we? Run! Run away! There's too many of them! Quick! Oh god! No! My buns! My succulent burger buns! Throughout history, humans have always relied on the strength of weapons. Prince Arthur used a sword, Oppenheimer had a bomb, Legolas used a bow, and even the simple caveman could hunt far more effectively with a wooden club, as seen here in the historically accurate flash game, Age of War. But what if the people are the problem? Say we remove them from the equation and instead created a species of sentient weapons, using the incredibly advanced life simulation game, Spore. I would bargain we might just take over the world. And so, only one question remained. Which weapon would I choose? Introducing the cannon. In my opinion, the cannon is the ultimate weapon. It has extreme power, pinpoint accuracy, sometimes, unless you're in an anime. And you can also use it as a method of transport if you climb inside. With this mouth-watering scientific project at my doorstep, I set about making my cannon creature, starting my journey all the way down at the very essence of life itself, Cell Stage. We began our journey in typical fashion by crashing into the sea on a giant space asteroid, already performing a cannonball, very nice, very on brand. But this, no, this will not do. I'm trying to make a weapon of mass destruction, not an aubergine. That's an eggplant for all you filthy Americans. My first course of action was to make my creature much more cylindrical, to create a kind of fleshy barrel that will eventually be able to fire ammunition out of it. This would be Canon Design version 1, but no, come on, we need a better name than that. How about, uh, Colin the Cannon? Okay, Colin, let's set out to sea. I figured he was perfect already, but I was mistaken, deeply, deeply mistaken, because it wasn't long until I stumbled upon a further upgrade. A jet. Now, most reasonable people would use this jet on the back of their creature as a method of propulsion. Little do they know, the jet actually doubles as the perfect shooting apparatus. I mean, sorry, look at that. We've literally made a cannon already. I don't need to do the rest of the video, I could just end it here. As genius as I was feeling in the moment though, this new build did have several glaring issues. The main one being that its mouth is now inside of the barrel, meaning that he no longer has the ability to eat. Something which some people would say is kind of important. But that was okay, there was an easy solution to this, and that was to move his mouth to the back. And this was great, only that it wasn't, because as his cannon face dragged him through the ocean, I now had to perform some sort of 180 trick shot whilst in motion to grab food as it drifted by. Hang on, just let me, uh, no, not quite, just, just give me a sec. No, come on, uh, no, uh, there we go. And what a painful next 20 minutes it was, until I finally decided I had had enough of this and I needed another way to get sustenance. Now, a stupid, boring normie might consider moving the mouth back to the front, but I had better ideas. Poison. Yes, in Spore there is a body part that fires out poison. And so if I combined my jet with this, hypothetically I would be able to shoot poison as if it were bullets. In reality though, I had forgotten the ocean is made of liquid, so any poison I do fire out just kind of dissipates in front of our own face, which is good, isn't it? I'm sure that's uh, healthy. The one upside to this toxic conundrum was that by swimming around, I was also poisoning everything else, meaning although I was struggling to eat, I could still at least collect more body parts to try, one of which I think was just what we needed. It's called the bagpipe mouth, sorry, the omnivore mouth, crafted carefully into a delicate tube, unless you make it massive, in which case it becomes the perfect cannon shape. 
Yes, this was it. Look at Colin go. He can't move for food now. In fact, he seems to be struggling to move at all. Ooh, it's a bit unwieldy. I'm noticing that we're a bit top heavy and it's sort of hampering our ability to maneuver or swim. Okay, we have to make this schnoz of ours a little bit smaller. Let me just find a mate somewhere around here. Uh-oh. It turned out my mouth was now so big that I couldn't get close enough with another member of my species to mate. This could be the end of my dynasty, but uh, thankfully some other creature came along and electrocuted us to death, and I was able to rectify the problem. With that, the rest of Cell Stage was a breeze, and in no time at all, I was popping on some legs and moving up onto land. Soon this whole world would be mine, but whoa, what's with all the skeletons? I mean, that is like an offensive amount of bones. There must have been some sort of battle here. I wondered what kind of hellscape awaited us. Oh well, that was a future problem. For now, we just had to focus on teaching Colin to be the best goddamn marksman this world has ever seen. Okay, Colin, there's a piece of lettuce in front of you. I want you to aim and fire. What? No, Colin, what are you doing? I didn't say anything about close combat. Right, this sort of behaviour needs to be sorted out straight away, Colin. Stop inhaling the lettuce. Cannons are supposed to blow, not suck. We aren't trying to make Henry Hoover here. I headed back to the drawing board, and via completely legitimate means, just give me a second here. Oh, what? That's crazy. We've got so much money now. Whoa. I discovered the spit ability. When you think about it, a cannonball is to a cannon what a ball of spit is to a living being. Look, it's a projectile. I don't care. It, it works, okay? And boy, did it work, because you cannot tell me that this creature doesn't look like it belongs on a pirate ship. On a real though, how have I managed to make this cannon so cute? He is adorable. I mean, He's a, a machine of war. You just watch, Colin is fearsome. And I set about testing out his new shooting abilities, taking position on some high ground above a nest of cheese. Colin set his sights and then, Quaw, what a shot. And again, Colin, two shots, one kill. Not bad. He really was quite the turret. That was a whole nest of cheese defeated. It was time to move on to bigger and better opponents, such as this gunpowder. Actually, as a cannon, that could be quite useful, Colin. Stuff some in your back pockets. No, we needed a real test, such as these toucans. We're about to turn them into a pile of feathers. Open fire, Colin. Loose. Let him have it. Uh, Colin, I don't mean to alarm you, but they're getting really rather close range and oh god, run, run away! But with his stubby little nubs, Colin remained very much stationary and he was pecked to death. In the hopes that I never had to see that harrowing scene again, I decided to give Colin what all good cannons need, some wheels. It took him a while to get used to these. Initially, he was just trying to use them as if they were normal feet. But with some more tweaks, he sort of got the hang of it. And from here on out, I could employ a new strategy. I called it the Simpsons Spit and Run. It's a pretty self-explanatory process. You just uh, spit and then ah, 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 and then another spit and then ah, ah, ah. Very cleverly keeping our distance from the target as any good sniper would do. This technique was so effective that not only did I take out the entire Toucan genus, but I waltzed my way through creature stage, scared of nothing and nobody. That is, until I accidentally wheeled Colin over a geezer and- Whoa! Colin, no! Oh, okay, phew. It's okay, guys, he's fine. He's made of steel, nothing can hurt him apart from- Uh-oh, who was this on the horizon? What? French people? What are French people doing here? I just don't believe it. Well, this would explain all of the bones everywhere. We've only gone and stumbled into the territory of the great dictator Napoleon Bonaparte. Oh god, even the spit and run strategy won't work against one of history's most evil military tacticians. And before Colin could wheel himself out of there, he was beaten up so hard that it made the game crash. A classic French revolutionary tactic. Well, that was unexpected. Colin knew that, being a cannon, he was going to have to get into a few battles, but the last thing he expected was to be reenacting the Napoleonic Wars. One thing was for certain, Colin needed an upgrade, and this particular modification I am pretty proud of because, thinking outside of the box, I noticed another projectile within Spore that most people would overlook. That's right, I'm talking about the humble stick. 
My idea was that by creating a larger barrel on the front of our cannon and placing an arm in the middle, we could pick up twigs and branches in front of us, then launching them into the air as you would a normal cannon. But okay, I take it back. This is the lamest idea I've ever had. I'm pretty sure that did no damage whatsoever. All we did is piss off a rogue. And yeah, as expected, didn't end very well. Okay, let's just undo everything we did there and instead think about the bigger picture because the truth is, on the field of battle, a cannon was no use by itself. Colin was not born to be a solo act. He should be part of a full brigade. With that, I began to befriend members of my own species until Colin had a fine-looking artillery division around him. This was the way. Take your positions on the hill, men. We would set up a full barrage. It's over, Napoleon. I have the high ground, screamed Colin, as he and his comrades fired a full volley on the measly French peasants below. That's it. Go back to the Renaissance Fair. The battle was over. But as it turns out, even back in the 18th century, France was quite a big country, and though we had won this small skirmish, the war would continue into tribal stage. <laughs> Setting up a small settlement, Colin and his cannons hunkered down, as Napoleon and the French built the brown village of, uh, Bordeaux? <laughs> I don't know, just across the way. The village itself was unimpressive, but just west of Bordeaux in, uh, I guess, Saint-Étienne? <laughs> Colin discovered the French had taken control of a mysterious stone formation. Weird carvings, horned demonic statues. It had all the hallmarks of a sacrificial burial ground. Or maybe it was just like a tourist attraction, like a predecessor to the Eiffel Tower. This whole storyline was getting a bit weird, and Colin was keen to nip the whole French Empire thing in the bud. So, in a move of pure force with no planning whatsoever, he went to the brown village and just dumped all of the gunpowder he had collected earlier onto their campfire. The result was a huge explosion, and as the dust settled, it revealed very little damage at all. Outnumbered, the cannons division were forced to retreat, whilst the city of Bordeaux made repairs to their town hall. Yeah, just hit it with a hammer, that'll do it. In an effort to recuperate from this devastating loss, Colin ordered his officers to head out and tame the wild animals to harvest their eggs. They tamed a pear, and a toucan, and a long boy, who was then abducted by an alien spaceship and never seen again. No matter, they now had enough food to support a growing army. This time, they would not be outnumbered. Making another charge on the brown village, my cannons made sure to leave no stone unturned. The melee was intense. Spears clashed against steel as Colin and his crew got way too close range. Like guys, remember, spit and run. All was well in the end though, as Bordeaux was set aflame in a really laggy cutscene, and the brown village, along with General Napoleon, were defeated. News of Napoleon's fall spread fast throughout the land, and clingers-on such as this group of poachers scrambled to seize power over the region. In this sense, the Pink Village would be my cannon's next targets, or they would be once they stopped being attacked by a giant bear. That's good, isn't it? I can just sit back and relax. Once the bear was gone, however, Colin noticed something rather interesting. The poachers had firearms of their own, in the form of the bright pink shotguns they carried around. As a literal sentient gun himself, Colin knew just how dangerous these weapons could be. And so, rather than attack head-on, he came up with an ingenious plan. The cannons division would send one brave soldier at a time to draw the enemy's fire. They would run around the town hall in circles, and just like that, the poachers would destroy their own village. This worked unbelievably well, to the point where you really have to question the poachers' intelligence, as they shot their own base to smithereens. My cannons were able to take control of the area, and we could advance, nasal first, into civilization stage. By this point, things were going really swimmingly. Cities of cannons were popping up all over the world, living, for the most part, in peace. Partially due to the deterrent of the cars I had created, which I don't know if you'd call them intimidating, but they did all carry a giant rocket launcher known as the War Crime on the top. Still, all there was to do now was bask in our utopia and collect money from these conveniently located spy skeezers. In my opinion, Spore sort of walked so that the Dune films could run. Soon we would become the richest colony in the universe. Uh, what's that thing coming out of the trees? No, it can't be. But I'd heard they were extinct. 
Standing tall behind the altar of strange stones was a giant, Welk. What sorcery, what black magic could have brought this terror back upon us and hang on, look at the map. Is that the brown nation again? But I wiped out that devious dictator Napoleon already only. Perhaps he wasn't the only one I had to worry about. And so we come to the man behind all of this. A name feared across the entire galaxy. So powerful he had seemingly resurrected the most fearsome species in history. Not a dictator, but the Ductator. Just by the sheer size of his monocle, Colin could tell this guy was bad news. So much so that on their Skype call, he could only think to tell him that his people were descended from limbless space slugs before hanging up. Forget politics though, they had to deal with that giant whelk, and fast. God forbid it were allowed to roam free, the chaos would be immeasurable. And so, mustering up the full strength of the cannon's division, a great fleet of, of war crime vehicles drove out to face it. They rained hell from up on high, down upon the Welk's spiny shell. Several cars were ripped apart in a whirlwind of gnashing jaws and fire. At one point, a giant toucan flew over and threatened to join the mix, which was not helpful at all. Go away, I've got enough to deal with. The problems kept piling up though, as, in the midst of this critical battle, Colin received a warning that one of his cities was under attack. How could this situation possibly get any worse but… oh, that's how. Of course Napoleon had been resurrected as well, and this time he was giant too! Not knowing how to deal with this incomprehensible threat, Colin did what he always did and just threw more cannons at the problem, decking out the walls of his city with turret after turret. Napoleon began to take heavy fire, but now a titan with thick skin and long legs, he waded into the city, crushing all under his giant French feet. This is it everyone, the end of all times. The universe is doomed and Colin the Cannon is just the start of it. You could say this is a canon event in the story. That's that's the joke guys. Do you, do you get it? That's the that's the joke. As the late great Ogilvy Maurice Hedgehog once said, gotta go fast. And this is absolutely true for me because I have a very important relay race coming up that I cannot lose. The only problem is, I make spore videos on YouTube, which by association means that I have no friends. I am lonely. I am really, really lonely. But there is hope, because if you would remember, the 2008 video game Spore is the greatest piece of life simulation technology ever invented. Perhaps then, by running a series of tests on multiple different specimens, I could create the fastest creature in existence, leaving my relay race rivals in the dark. Dust. With this, I jumped straight into the game where I found that, oh, it appears when I last loaded up this game, I was roleplaying as a tomato. I'll be honest, this tomato isn't exactly, uh, rapid, but no matter, this will give me a good opportunity to demonstrate the ins and outs of my experiment. I will be creating a range of specimens from the sensible to the outlandish. I shall then test each of them in a straight 100 meter sprint and subsequently across this expertly devised obstacle course. The subject will begin on the runway. There will be a sprint start down the straight, giving us an initial impression of acceleration, until they hit the ramp. It's a tough ascent to the top and then it's… oh. Oh god, he's stuck already. Okay, gonna have to sort that one out. Anyway, after wiggling their way through that impassable wall, the test subject will then weave between the maze of stone pillars, slalom their way in and out of the giant, uh, circular target things, then fighting their way through the dense undergrowth. Ooh, look how dense it is. Oh, he's really struggling there, it's so dense. Round the first corner we have the bridge section, very dangerous, lots of missing planks and potential splinters, and then following that there's an ice cold plunge into the lake because we need to make sure our specimens are fast not just on land but in every terrain and speaking of terrain as we round cactus corner bully our way through the barrels oh uh, just a sec. Yeah, bully our way through the barrels. We reach this bumpy mountainous section which ends with a long hard climb up what is essentially Mount Everest in grassy hill format. Around the third corner and onto the final straight it's into the ball pit just because I, I thought it'd be funny. 
through the mushroom forest and then it's an all out dash across the finish line. So, now that my ingenious experiment was set out, it was time to come up with our first specimen. When I picture creatures that are fast, the first thing I picture is your mother, actually, when she's running over to my house. So, the first thing that actually comes to mind is, of course, a cheetah. Cheetahs are famous for being the quickest mammals on this earth. Able to reach speeds between 60 and 70 miles per hour, they also don't really look like this. But it was the best I could do, okay? I'm working with limited tools here and I know it might not initially appear to be moving that fast but just trust in the process for a second because when I press the sprint button look ready yeah there we go look at that raw speed it's like a Ferrari with legs and oh no wait hang on he's run out of energy that's okay though because it's all about what this cheetah can do over 100 meters so let's head to our test course and begin to do some real rigorous scientific examination we'll be using a tomato as our point Point of reference just for comparison's sake, so let's see how our cheetah fares. Ready? Three, two, one, and they're off to an underwhelming start. What? The tomato is winning? How is the tomato winning? Come on, cheetah, step it up, get your feet moving. Ah, oh, and across the line. Well, first test done, and we've been beaten by a fruit with legs. Not the best start, I know, but uh, the problem is cheetahs aren't used to running on tracks. This is a wild animal we're dealing with. It should be out there in the Serengeti where every move is life or death, and in that sense, I think the obstacle course will be much more our big cat's forte. Here we go then, yep, great start on the runway. What is is, why is it doing some sort of hamster dance? What is that? Anyway, let's continue up the ramp and over the lip, then through the stone pillars with absolutely zero problems. And just gaze upon the way it ducks and weaves between the targets. That is majestic. Now we reach the cheetah's home turf, the undergrowth. See how naturally it stalks between the bushes. Just so comfortable. I feel like we're in the plains of the African savanna right now. Minimal trouble with the rope bridges and in into the drink at a good pace, making great time around Cactus Corner too, and straight through the barrels, but then a little bit of trouble in the mountainous section. Guys, it's just not used to these sort of hills, and oh great, now it's hiding. You guys were all slating it in the comments, saying like, oh, you're just a leopard from Poundland. And now the cheetah's feelings are hurt, and he's stuck underneath the side panelling, and he's never gonna finish the test. Oh, this is a monumental failure. I had to go back to the drawing board. What was it about what I created so far that could be improved? Well, apart from everything. And then it hit me. It only had four legs. You see, in my educated opinion, and I think I know what I'm talking about here, more legs equals more speed. So, returning to the tomato, and I really don't want to have to keep harking back to the tomato, but I started to add to it appendage by appendage. I kept adding and kept adding until the game couldn't even really take it anymore and oh god no, avert your eyes everyone, my creature has imploded. Alright, well let's just go with as many legs as possible without my game turning into a 90s techno rave. And there we have it. It's perfect. Okay, sure, sometimes in testing it did randomly turn blue as if it had been highlighted, but giddy with excitement, I headed over to the testing area and faced it up against our cheetah in the 100 meters. The race was intense, with the cheetah getting off to a strong start. But, using all of his many limbs, my new test subject soared his way into the lead to record a remarkable improvement. We now knew that this was our fastest specimen so far, but the question remained, how would it fare on the obstacle course? Well, not too favourably as it turns out. What I hadn't realised is that, with all of its legs, this creature had ended up being quite long. As a result, it had an annoying habit of getting wedged in the simplest of places. Do you know what though, apart from the odd stuck episode, this was definitely the best thing we had made, and I was confident that just a few tweaks would sort everything out. So I headed back to the creature creator, and this time rather than thinking horizontally, I decided to think vertically. What if instead of stacking my creature's legs behind each other, I layered them upwards in a sort of tiered system? This way you still have all the appendages, but in a much more 
more confined space. And I know what people's reaction is going to be. When it walks, it looks like a pile of spaghetti falling down a hill. But it doesn't need to be attractive to be fast. I'm not trying to marry it, you know. I, I wasn't going to propose to it. It's not like I'm scared of rejection or anything. It's, it's literally fine. No, the most important thing was that this creature was quick. Something we could only find out with yet another series of examinations. It passed the 100 meters with flying colors, beating our previous iteration by a head and shoulders. Or, I don't know, like 18 shoulders or however many this thing has. Once again though, the obstacle course proved to be our downfall, as it was very much the same problem different dimensions. This time, our creature was too wide. So wide in fact that it couldn't even fit across the first rope bridge. This was the widest thing I had seen since Wide Boy, and therefore, it never completed the course. <sighs> I don't know, this whole legs thing has got me in a real spin. You know, maybe it's not all about legs. Maybe it's more about what's on the end that counts. That's right, I'm talking about feet! Now, there are some people out there who really like feet, and although I'm proud to say I'm not one of them, it is hard to turn down the feet on this next creature that I have made. Cool, look at the size of those bad boys. You'll notice if we focus on stats here for a second, these feet actually claim to have a sprint speed of five, which is already five more than we initially had. And the way this creature walks, it's so graceful, isn't it? Just these huge floating strides which when we head over to the 100 meters track are actually deceptively fast. This creature is not only beating the cheetah, he's positively smoking him. Stomped all over the competition, so let's see how he fares on the obstacle course. It is quite hard to get a good angle of this creature because his feet are just that ginormous they don't fit on camera, but honestly maybe that plays to its advantage because its feet are so big that it can just stride over the wall and skip most sections of the course, and if no one sees it cheating, it, it doesn't count. So yeah, zero problems through the undergrowth section, just waltzed over that. Bit glitchy over the rope bridges, yeah, just a little bit glitchy there, and unfortunately Cactus Corner did end up being a real problem. Big Feet finding that section completely impassable, but um, I'm going to choose to take the positives out of this situation and say that we're headed in the right direction. I think really what this creature needs now is a failsafe, some way to get out of glitchy territory when he inevitably stomps into it, and I think we can give this to him through the ability to jump. And so, heading back to the lab with a pen and a pad, I replaced his bare paws with some new beautiful webbed frog's feet. And this really did the trick. Now my Bigfoot could leap and bound over anything. All it took was a quick hop, and difficulties such as Cactus Corner were an issue no more. Look at how high he's flying through the air. Thank goodness we have such a lovely carpet of barrels to land on next. Oh! Oh god! He's dead! How did that happen? Okay, note to self, never use explosive barrels to break fall. Right, well it seems we're going to have to come at this issue from a different angle once again. The most dangerous thing for my creature was his massive surface area, and actually when I took into account his distribution, all of his power was coming from his massive, massive ankles. No wonder he came to an explosive end, so first off, I bulked up my creature's muscles so that his raw power could be dispersed more equally. And I mean, look at those thighs. That that is impressive, you could crush like multiple skulls between those things. Then, in a move that nobody would have foreseen coming, I gave my creature one of each type of foot. Because as Hannah Montana once said, it's the best of both worlds. And it truly was this, because I think you'll agree, the final product is a sight for sore eyes. Just even the way he runs screams Olympian to me. And just like Usain Bolt when he took to the track in Beijing 2008, the competition was no match. I had done it. This creature was the one. I challenge you to find anything. Sports cars, missiles, uh, the roadrunner from that one cartoon, anything that could even remotely think of beating this creature in a race. Heck, this subject soared across the obstacle course like a dream, clearing the stone pillars entirely, audaciously front-flipping over the undergrowth, smashing through barrel after barrel like toys, and making mincemeat of the ball pit before grinding across the outer wall like Tony Hawk and crossing the finish line in what felt like the blink of an eye. Yes, he would be the gem in the crown of my 4x100 meter relay team. So taking stock we have uh, lots of legs, we have big feet, we have big thighs and oh, my bad that's only 3 out of 4. 
To be honest, I cannot be bothered making any more of these creatures. I have done far too much science for one day, so let's just pick one from my creature compendium, shall we? Da -da 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 -da, just surfing the catalogue real quick. We need something that's an all-rounder, an amalgamation of our successes here today. I'm looking for about six to eight legs, fast feet but good proportions, maybe a bit of protective body armor as well to avoid exploding barrels, but... <gasps> No way! How stupid have I been? Well, this whole experiment was a waste. The fastest little guy in existence has been under my nose all along. It's a creature I made years ago. Yes, it's all so clear now. My fourth member will be Mr. Pinchy! Oh, Mr. Pinchy, I missed you. The way you skip across the floor at hundreds of miles an hour whilst I stare into your adorable, beady little soulless eyes. And what's that, Mr. Pinchy? You've got new merchandise out on bogboymerch.com. Well, that's convenient, and you know me, I am shameless. Now you just have to go in the team. And so, me and my crew set out across the land, venturing to the location of our big relay race. In fact, here it is right now. Ah, what a stadium. Bit weird that the stands are made of wooden planks considering the prestige of this event, but I'm sure on the inside is a pristine athletics track. Oh no. Oh no, 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 not again. I'm sure that invitation to the 2024 Olympic Games was legit. I cannot possibly have been stitched up again by poachers. Oh god, everybody run! Please, poachers, don't poach me. I'll do anything. Just don't steal my perfect specimens. I worked so hard on them. Oh god, there goes big thighs. Okay, I take it back. You can have any of them. Just not Mr. Pinchy. Please not Mr. Pinchy. Don't poach him. He's not, he's not an egg. Mr. Pinchy, no! A whopping 80% of the world's oceans remain unexplored by humankind. What is it we don't know? What's lurking in those murky depths? What's down there? Well, I'll tell you, it's sea monsters! From Godzilla to Free Willy, the ocean is hiding our Earth's most powerful creatures, and I say that's a hot shame. If I was able to coax some of these kaiju onto land, conquering the planet would be a literal walk in the park. Just imagine the Meg with legs, Cthulhu taking a canter, and all I'm saying is there's a reason the great mythological sea serpent is called Jormungandr. But to get these big fish walking, I'll need to harness the power of the world's greatest life simulation technology. That's right, it's the 2008 video game, Spore. And so, starting all the way down in the deep blue depths of the Marianas Trench or something, I began to think about how to make my sea creature particularly monstrous. Now, apart from weebs and people who play Splatoon, one thing I'm led to believe most people find scary is tentacles. I'm talking the giant squid, the kraken, the watcher, the, uh ball of noodles? I can't lie, my first attempt didn't exactly send a shiver down my spine. He was a bit too wibbly to be scary. But the other problem was he was absolutely rapid. Oh my god. Slow down, man. I can barely control you. You're gonna crash and- Oh great. Look, 30 seconds in and we've already had a road traffic accident. No, we needed to restart because when you think of the archetypal sea monster, they're all these big lumbering giants. There must be some Something about being slow that's particularly intimidating, and in pursuit of that, I decided to exchange all of my tentacles in favour of some sharp, threatening spikes. Yeah! No one dares crash into me now, and that's mostly because I'm never going to reach anybody moving at this speed. I'm having second thoughts about this whole slow thing. Don't get me wrong, the idea of this guy gradually creeping towards me is pretty terrifying, but there has to be some sort of middle ground we can find because watching this is painful. And after allowing myself to use just one tentacle, my big breakthrough came about halfway through cell stage, when I stumbled upon a body part known as the proboscis, or as I call it, the bagpipe mouth. You see, I worked out that by surrounding myself with mouths instead of spikes, I could still maintain a somewhat leisurely pace, and the creatures around me would just swim into my many awaiting jaws to be sucked dry. It was a frightening concept, but more than anything this just allowed me to speedrun my way through the rest of Cell Stage because 
I was bored, and the real crux of our experiment was going to happen on land. Before that, however, I was met with another big redesign opportunity, and I still hadn't quite got past the idea of making some sort of Cthulhu-esque creature. I just think that tentacles are the way forwards, and you can quote me on that on my gravestone. I mean, just think for a second. The Sarlacc Pit from Star Wars, Davy Jones from Pirates of the Caribbean, them squid things from Doctor Who. I could go on. The octopus-type sea monster is a classic, and if I can honour that within sport, then I will do anything in my power to... Oh god, I've ended up making the preschooler from Finding Nemo, haven't I? I don't know, guys. I'm just not good at making scary creatures. I can do cute, I can do fruit, but maybe sea monsters was just biting off a bit more than I could chew. Perhaps it would be best if we just sack the whole thing off and head back to the ocean where we belong. Oh my god, what is that? Wow! Now that is what I'm talking about! A proper sea monster! Typical that, isn't it? Just when you're all out of inspiration, you find exactly what you were looking for. I had to get another glimpse of this magnificent green beast, but having been dragged down to the bottom of the ocean inside of his jaws, I now had no idea where I was. What is this? Spore doesn't have an aquatic stage. I should know, I've made 25 bloody videos on the game. Oh god, I need to get a hobby. Anyway, priority number one was to find my way back to the surface whilst keeping an eye out for that big, green, beautiful boy. But as hard as I squinted my beady little eyes, he was nowhere to be seen. I passed by all manner of weird and wacky specimens, some of which were so big they nearly trampled me to death. But none of these got my juices flowing quite like our scaly friend from earlier on. And so, breaching sea level and heading out onto land for the second time this playthrough, I decided that if I couldn't see the perfect sea monster again, I would instead be the perfect sea monster. So, if I remember correctly, his head was sort of like this shape, and he had his legs like this? No wait, did he have legs? Well, he definitely had arms, and one thing I am sure about is he was bright green, just like a frog. Ah, oh, I've made a frog. Every single thing I do always goes wrong. Right, back to the sea we go then. Third time's the charm, I suppose. But wait, there he is again! Ah, okay, I see. So we can actually summon him anytime we want by using ourselves as bait. But the only problem is, our stupid frog creature isn't quite interesting enough to convince him to stick around. Perhaps then, if I was to find some more interesting specimens to give us offerings to our drowned god, we might be able to win his favour and thus ask him to conquer the world for us while we sit back and relax. It was a genius plan. And with that, I set about finding some suitable sacrifice candidates, such as these tadpoles. Uh, technically, now that I'm a frog, these are my kids, so I think sacrificing them to an aquatic demon would be a touch inappropriate. In that case, what about these penguins? Uh, not bad. Upon conversing with the penguins, I found out that their captain, Peter, was a pirate with a bounty of 100 million schmecks. You've sold me already, Peter. You will make for a very expensive sea monster's happy meal. So just come this way, Peter. We're going to take very good care of you and just don't think about what's to come in the future. Just enjoy the ride. Take in the adventure. Although, maybe don't get too close to that massive toad. Oh god, he's been abducted. Put him down, Toad. That man is worth a lot of money. And Peter, no! Oh, okay. Phew, he's fine. More to the point, I did not know Toads could be so powerful. Perhaps one of them would make a good sacrifice as well. And so, making my frogs even more persuasive by upgrading them in the creature creator, which, by the way, are we being born in a pile of feces? Is that, is that normal? I found some Toads of a more palatable size and signed them up to my crew. Come on then, Mr. Toad, follow me and all of your dreams will come true. Remember the children's books, Mr. Toad? We're best friends, aren't we? I am very trustworthy and not trying to use you in a satanic ritual. Plus, no way! Look, everyone, it's only the Loch Ness Monster. Nessie, what are you doing here? Well, the Green Sea King will love this. We can just trade one mythical dinosaur for another. Yep, follow us, Nessie. You will be a worthy bargaining chip. I mean, member of the team. And speaking of our team, actually, as good as this tiny little toad is, it would be really nice to get the giant toad on board. So, let's think. Maybe if we're clever about it, we can sort of kite him towards the sea. Over here, Mr. Giant Toad. 
Follow the frog. I feel like I'm at an airport terminal. Yeah, left a bit, right a bit, forward a bit, but oh god, not too far forward because what is that? Okay, apparently toads aren't the only giant creatures around these parts. This is bad news. Look at the size of those thighs. That's ridiculous. They've probably got their own gravitational fields. And our giant toad was so intimidated by the sheer girth of this walking tomato's legs that he ran away. Ah well, I suppose the original casting crew would have to do then. But that's okay, we've got a good range of specimens here, so I'm sure the green sea monster will find something to his liking in the buffet we've provided him. All we had to do now was head back out into the water and here he comes. Oh ho ho! What? He only ate me? You've missed a bit, you've got some leftovers man. Jesus, how picky is this guy? You won't be able to go onto your pudding unless you eat your main course. Oh, fine. You win this time, sea monster. I guess we'll just have to ramp things up another notch. It was time to head into tribal stage. In very diplomatic fashion, the frogs and toads decided to separate into different villages. So long, my toady friends. But just as one window closes, another door opens, because a third tribe, one known as the Crustacean Nation, had moved into the area and were currently being attacked by a giant bear. This was excellent news, not just because it was funny to watch, but because, by swooping in and saving the day, my frogs could win favour with this Mr. Pinchy and his disciples, and also harvest the bear's meat to bring us an offering for the Sea King. Surely even he couldn't resist some premium bear steak. And so, using his exemplary taming abilities, my tribe leader pulled a giant horn from his back pocket, used it to summon a local nest of soup dragons, and took them with him as the big battle commenced. With a mixture of scales and shells, crabs, frogs and dragons formed the perfect trinity. Having to fight on so many different fronts, the bear was overwhelmed, and within a matter of moments, he fell to the floor with a booming thud. After celebrating their joint victory with a quick disco, my frogs harvested the bear for all of its tender loin. And for what they hoped would be the final time, they gathered by the seashore and prepared to host the ultimate ritual. Pulling out his weird conical horn from his back pocket once more, my chieftain played a hearty rendition of the song Ocean Man by Ween. It was tear-jerking, and as the rest of the tribe positioned bowls of bear meat down by the water's edge, suddenly the surface began to rumble and there he was! Oh great sea monster, we honour you! Please don't forsake us again! But this time was different. The monster gave a cheery wave, and against all the odds, swam over to us for a friendly chat. As it turned out, bear meat was his favourite food, and he was actually a really down-to-earth guy. I mean, he was bursting with charisma, and was more than happy to help my frogs out with simple matters such as world domination. He even went out of his way to introduce us to his friend, the Leviathan, who was difficult to understand as she spoke in exclusively whale noises, but she didn't stick around long enough for it to be too awkward, so it was fine. Well then, all's well that ends well, I suppose. I guess let's just get on with conquering the planet. Uh, what's that up there on the horizon? I don't have my glasses on, I can't quite see. Oh no. No, please not him again. I'd recognise that monocle anywhere. From completely out of nowhere, it was the Duck Tater. What did he want this time? He had already foiled one of my most promising experiments in the cannons division, and that army of ducks gathering behind him suggested he was about to try and foil another. In a deafening chorus of patted feet and quacks, they began to charge down the hill. The wave of brown feathers got closer and closer until they aren't going to, they wouldn't try and take down my beloved sea monster. No! Run, my green friend! Quickly, back into the deep! Oh, please don't do this! He's such a lovely guy! But the Ductator commanded his army without mercy, for he had a devious plan. Taking the sea monster's remains, he fed it to one of the local toads. What was that all about? But then, as if by magic, the subject began to grow and grow, not stopping until... <gasps> So that's how they were made. We've run into so many giant creatures over the god knows how many episodes I've made that how many save files? 
How many sea monsters had to die in service of this diabolical practice? What great number of giants did this Ductator now command? And worst of all, what did he plan to use them for? I don't mean to toot my own horn, but I am one of this generation's most brilliant scientific minds. And yet, just because I do all of my research within the 2008 life simulation game Spore, apparently I'm not eligible for a Nobel Prize. Well, I was so angered by this that, I hate to admit it, I've made a mistake. Somewhere amongst my many successful experiments, I made a species of ducks. They seemed innocent enough until things started to get a bit out of hand. Before I knew it, they had formed a duck mafia, ruled by an evil tyrant known as the Ductator. Since then, the Ductator had found his way into my other save files, corrupting my game. I've searched through all of my Windows firewall settings, but I think we now have only one hope. The fate of my game, of the world, lay in the wings of my original uncorrupted specimen. To take down this evil organization, we would be using Patient Zero, also known as Dimitri the Duck. The big issue was that Dimitri had been captured by the Mafia already and was currently being held captive in a high security prison. Nice one, Dimitri. Yes, this cage was completely inescapable. He would never see the sun again, doomed to die here alone. But as well as being very morbid, that wasn't necessarily true. As, peering into the cage next to him, he spotted, Huh? Mr. Pinchy, what are you doing here? Mr. Pinchy was a legendary galactic hero, but also a crab, and crabs have very poor attention spans. So before he could explain how he too was captured, he got bored of being in prison and used his crab claws to snip his way out. Thankfully, he wasn't quite bored enough to ignore letting Dimitri go too. And just like that, their jailbreak had begun. Sneaking their way past the armoured sentry guards, they sprinted through a maze of sinister corridors before reaching a mysterious, futuristic room. Machines whirred and beeped around them, and as they reached the back of the hall, a console of sorts displayed a screen which read, Master Plan Volume 2. It detailed a map marked with a series of beacons, the instructions reading that once each beacon was activated, it would create a bridge between worlds, crossing an unknown void space known as the menu. This was all very confusing. I mean, what did one of these beacons even look like? Thankfully, there was a prototype example in the showroom next to them. According to the screen, two beacons had already been compromised. This was bad news. If the Ductator got his filthy wings on any more, he could mount a conquest of the whole universe. Dimitri's only option was to beat him to it, and he headed straight for the prison exit, hoping to find the remaining beacons and recruit a rebel force before the Ductator could amass an army of his own. But hang on Dimitri, this doesn't seem like the exit, this is way too high up in the air to be a- Oh. Oh dear. It was too late. Poachers, ducks, a giant whelk, and even a giant mushroom for some reason. The worst of the worst had already gathered, chanting and screaming the Ductator's name in a foul chorus. The enemy would strike before anybody knew they were coming. Time was of the essence, and in a panic, Dimitri sprinted back to the showroom and took a gamble. Jumping straight into the prototype beacon he had seen earlier, he was surprised to find that it actually worked, and he was teleported to a completely different planet. Right, now to find those beacons, but hold on, what on earth is going on over there? A council of gigantic wide boys were positioned in a semicircle, the same semicircle formation that the beacons had appeared in on the map. So that's how it worked. The pieces were all fitting into place. At some point during their evolution, these wide boys had grown so wide that the very fabric of reality stretched around them, thus merging points in time and space together. Yes, it all made so much sense. And by that logic, to teleport between save files, Dimitri would have to enter these wide boys one by one. Don't get your minds out of the gutter, everyone. This is a this is a PG show. 
What was worse, it appeared the French, soldiers of the Ductator's right-hand man Napoleon, had begun attacking the first wide boy. With a great running jump, Dimitri flung himself into the creature's immense width. He was engulfed in a blazing white light. Stars, constellations, the very fabric of space itself melted around him until, as if by magic, he had arrived on an entirely new planet and was confronted by eggs. What? Why were there just a bunch of fried eggs? What, what was this, the chicken planet or something? But where he expected to find chicken, he instead found beef. A tribe of burgers had set up a restaurant nearby. These were not exactly the warriors Dimitri was hoping to recruit. Sure, they made a hell of an eggs benedict, but oh shizzle. Listen, I can hear the sound of accordions, the French have arrived. The Napoleonic soldiers marched into the village and began to tear the poor delicious gourmet guys to shreds. It was hopeless. These burgers had no means of defense. Their only armor was that of a sesame seeded bun. It appeared Dimitri would have to find his fighters elsewhere. But just as the battle appeared to be over, the burgers head chefs and sous chefs went and grabbed a bunch of bug zappers from the kitchen supply cabinet. And against the odds, they began to immobilize the French forces by electrocuting them one after the other. This technique was highly effective. Perhaps a hamburger taser unit would be just what the resistance needed. With that, the burgers were on side, and they followed Dimitri back through the wide boy wormhole as he prepared to venture through his second beacon. With another running jump, this time he found himself in, brrr, in some sort of frozen wasteland. Forget soldiers, Dimitri would be surprised to find any life at all out here, but oh, he stood corrected. What in the name of sanity were two elephants doing out here? It just so turned out that these were Stinky and Small Paul, a newlywed couple who were hoping to celebrate their honeymoon with some old friends in the form of a bunch of goats. Dimitri didn't want to ruin the elephant's holiday with news about the potential end of the universe, so he attempted to recruit the goats to his side instead. The goats, however, were not very helpful. They told Dimitri that the time of goats is over, and then proceeded to walk away into the distance. In a turn of fortune, however, Stinky happened to know a good number of creatures, and she said that if it was new friends they were looking for, they just had to visit the next planet over. So back through the wide boy teleportation system it was, and this time their journey took them into a swamp. Ugh. Dimitri wasn't sure about this, and he was even less certain when they were immediately surrounded by a group of weird-looking frogs. But it wasn't frogs that Stinky had brought them here to meet. Instead, they were to be introduced to one of the oldest and wisest powers in the galaxy, the Soup Dragons. Wow. With these on his side, even a giant whelk wouldn't stand a chance, but the Soup Dragons were currently busy cooking up a huge order of their world-famous soup. Some far-off political figure was having a large gathering, and apparently he needed party snacks. Something about feeding an army or something? Oh, yeah. Dimitri had forgotten to mention about the massive army marching their way. So he began to divulge all of the Ductator's master plans, this time remembering to include the part where everybody everywhere is overcome by infinite warfare. Stinky was surprisingly chill about the situation. Sure, there was a distant threat, but the universe was so big that it would take them ages to march over to a place such as this. Oh no, the Ductator was right behind them, wasn't he? To make things worse, he had brought a battalion of big thighs with him, who, despite being held off momentarily by the local frogs, were absolutely rapid, like unbelievably fast. They were so quick, in fact, that in the resulting chase, Dimitri, the most athletic of their crew, had to draw them away, and he and the elephants were separated. A member down as they escaped the soup caverns, Stinky was now grasping the severity of their circumstances. What in the world did she do next? She could try hiring a group of sellsword mercenaries she'd heard about known as the Cannons Division, but with the cost of the honeymoon, as well as spending all of her hard-earned cash buying small paul back from a group of poachers, she couldn't afford them. All of their hopes now lay on the other side of these two final white boy wormholes. Please let this next one lead to an actually good planet. Come on, just give us a bit of luck, but oh no. Anywhere but there, the penultimate teleporter was connected straight to the Welk Zone. The Ductator had beaten them to it. 
he had already opened the gate, which, this time, spanned not just through space, but back through time, to a point where whelks had not yet been extinct. A sea of ancient evil mollusks came pouring through the portal, and, in a split decision, Stinky gave Small Paul some crucial instructions. She ordered him to take what fighters they had through the final wormhole to the fabled elephant stronghold of Helm's Toot. It was there they would make their final stand. But she would not join him just yet. Stinky had business elsewhere. Look for me to the east, at first light on the second or third-ish day. It was difficult to be specific about timings now that time travel was part of the equation. And with that, the newlyweds bid each other farewell. Paul and the burghers marched through the portal and across a vast grassy plateau, all the way to the impressive Helm's Toot. Built by the mighty elephant clans of old, its walls were near impenetrable, save for a big archway in the middle which was unideal for defensive purposes. What was even more unideal though, was the numbers they had. They couldn't man such a gargantuan fortress with a crab and a couple of burghers. What was Stinky thinking? This place would not be their salvation, it was merely the home of their inevitable demise. The low drone of a war horn echoed throughout the walls of the castle. So it begins. They were here, but hang on, that wasn't the Ductator's war horn. That sounded more like the song Ocean Man by Ween. A ray of hope, Dimitri was alive! And to everyone's delight, he had brought much needed reinforcements. A regiment of frogs, followed by the legendary sea monster Leviathan, come to avenge their sadly departed green scaly friend. And it didn't stop there, for, by letting Commander Colin have a few free shots of his sniper rifle, Dimitri had managed to sign up the cannons division as well. Paul couldn't believe it. There was still some good in this universe, and they would not go down without a fight. The cannons took their positions along the wall, ready to rain fire onto whatever wicked creatures would soon march below, and they had formed their ranks not a moment too soon, as, with an explosive boom, the wormhole reopened, and, in a force bigger than the galaxy had ever seen, the Ductator's army had arrived. Welks, poachers, ducks, and the French each regiment of monsters was more frightening than the last. What can elephants do against such reckless hate? wondered Small Paul, who stood shuddering atop the keep of the vast stone fortress, Helm's Toot. This castle would be his only salvation. Its walls were thick and impenetrable, apart from a massive archway in the middle, which he'd instructed his friend the Leviathan to just plug up with a huge barrel. Hopefully that'd do the trick. A giant whale, a handful of frogs, and a tribe of sentient burghers had gathered to his aid. But it was not enough. As a dreadful silence fell over the battlefield, he knew the end was near. They were the universe's final hope, and yet they would soon be absolutely wrecked and murked and stunted on by a duck with a monocle. With what could only be described as the most terrifying quack they'd ever heard, the Ductator signalled his forces to charge, and the final battle had begun. Marauding across the ground at some speed, it was no time before claws clashed against webbed hands and feet. And though you wouldn't expect a frog-based infantry to be particularly effective, they met the Ductator's armada with equal force. The Wall of Green held strong, and, strategically backed up by a burger taser unit, they were able to whittle the enemy down through a series of electric shocks. The Allied Forces sniper, Dimitri, headed round the back, picking off the larger threats one by one with his rifle. His main targets were these mutated tomato creatures, which had disproportionately large thighs. He had been chased by them once before, and knew just how devastating they could be. So, mounting the walls and using it as a springboard, Dimitri splattered tomato juice across the grass with a series of impressive 360 trick shots. Although, I don't know, does this classify as a 360? I've never really thought of Spore as an eSport, so I'm not sure what the rules are. His companion, a crab named Mr. Pinchy, was keen to get in on the action. But crabs have very poor attention spans, and Mr. Pinchy was already bored with this whole war and conflict business, and decided to leave in search of more entertainment. 
Despite one of their best fighters going for a mid-battle stroll, in a shocking turn of events, the Allies were actually doing quite well. They had reduced the opposition to a smattering of soldiers, who all seemed to be currently engaged in a collective PTSD flashback. Ah, uh, war never changes. Is this all you can conjure, Ductator? tutored Small Paul, rather arrogantly assuming they'd nip the whole destruction of the universe thing in the bud. But he had spoken far too soon, as, with a clap of thunder, two more galactic portals split the sky, and the Ductator's real forces arrived. It was an army that was supposed to be extinct, but by reaching his dark, shadowy wing back through time, the Ductator had resurrected the might of the Welk Zone. A wave of shells flooded the battlefield, swamping whatever frogs remained under an endless carpet of vicious mollusks. But this riptide contained not only run-of-the-mill sea snails, some of these bad boys were giant and mounted with cannons. These were foes that only a fellow monster could deal with. The Leviathan knew her duty. You shall not pass, she shouted, quoting her favourite movie. She would not allow them beyond that barrel. With four against one, the stakes were hardly in her favour. The Welks fired round after round from the plasma cannons mounted to their scaly hides. All she could do was flop about in a sort of weird humping motion. It was an unconventional fighting stance, that's for sure. However, the Leviathan still had a trick up her flipper. There was a reason they wrote myths and legends about her, and to everyone's surprise, she suddenly began to get smaller. How was that supposed to help against a troop of giant whelks? But, in conserving her power, she could unleash an incredible ability. Sending an exhale of icy cold breath from her jaws, she froze one of the whelks completely solid. The Arctic seas in which she lived were a cold and unforgiving place, so while she was over there she swallowed a load of ice and kept it in her mouth for times of need. With this, she was able to expel a kind of frosty solution, which turned her enemies one by one into ice cubes. With a little bit of rinse and repeat, she would be well on her way to victory. Meanwhile, the smaller Welk army had cleared the field, and were advancing on the castle walls. They formed ranks and attempted to scale the walkway. Their numbers were too many, Dimitri feared the worst, but the cannons division had other ideas. Under the confident command of their captain Colin, they sent volley after volley down the cobbles. The Welks tried to break through with their fiery breath and gnashing teeth, but a bombardment of epic proportions stopped them in their tracks. The cannons division were steadfast, and so the Welks sought another way to breach the fortress. Making a U-turn, they rushed in their masses towards the archway, and with the Leviathan otherwise engaged, they had a free run at the giant barrel. The Welks cascaded into it, forcing it to do all sorts of weird glitchy maneuvers. Thankfully, it was far too big and heavy to squeeze underneath, and the cannons division were able to mop up any strays that did manage to worm their way into the keep. Ever the military tactician, the Ductator made a strategic decision to utilize his giant toad and giant mushroom. The toad assumed the role of a battering ram, flopping himself against the barrel with the aim of splitting it into pieces. This was bad news. If they made it through that archway, they could surround the main tower from behind and the fight would be as good as over. Who could challenge such a massive toad? Dimitri, the burghers, and especially Small Paul would be crushed underfoot in a millisecond. Just as defeat seemed certain, however, salvation appeared on the horizon. It was the Soup Dragons. They had come after all. What a morale boost. Even just staring into their massive cartoony eyes, you could sense the unlimited wisdom and ancient power. And they demonstrated this immediately, performing a series of combination moves by vaulting off one another's backs to attack from above. The teamwork was impeccable. It was like watching the Power Rangers, but with more culinary expertise. With a couple of wombo combos, the Toad and Mushroom were down, and the dragons assumed defensive positions in front of the giant barrel. They set about holding back the ocean of whelks at their feet, just booting them as far as possible like a bunch of footballs. With these three around, Small Paul felt they could hold out forever, but whoa, hold on, no, the blue soup dragon doesn't appear to be doing so well, and what, no, their health bars were disappearing at an alarming rate. 
So this was the true extent of the Ductator's forces. So powerful they could take down even living gods? I'm fed up of Welks, man, I swear down. Literally the worst creature in existence. That title, however, would soon be up for debate, as the evil tyrant called forth yet more of his dark minions. And this time, oh dear, it was giant Napoleon with his French armada. And even worse, standing next to him was Eren Jaeger. Oh, it was over. I've seen Attack on Titan, there's no way we're defeating this guy. The two colossal men stomped across the battlefield, leaving great craters in their wake. This was it then. Small Paul was all out of trump cards. Mr. Pinchy had abandoned him. Dimitri was buried under a heap of moustache-twirling Frenchmen. The Leviathan was still chipping away at those pesky giant whelks, not realising that soon the main tower behind her would be surrounded. Paul and whoever remained would be trapped, and all the good in this world would be extinguished in one fell swoop. If he could have had but one final wish, it would have been to see the love of his life stinky again. Considering the situation, however, he hoped instead she was far, far away, living out the rest of her days at the edge of space. What was it she'd said to him again? Look for me at first light on the second-ish day. Well, that would be sort of around now. <gasps> Well, there was a sight for sore eyes. It couldn't be. The legendary crew assembled once again. Fruitius Maximus, Barnaby Bear, Peter the Penguin, Mr. Fish Fingers, and oh look, that's where Mr. Pinchy went. That makes more sense now. Like a contrived piece of plot armor or a poorly written twist, Stinky the Elephant had come through at just the right time. Although arguably if they'd arrived a bit earlier, there would have been considerably less bloodshed, but they were here now nonetheless. And with a great charge and a trumpet of her snout, they stormed down the hill with triumphant flair. Plums, bananas, mountain goats, and a massive yeti at their side. Even Eren Jaeger would have to tremble in fear, although is the yeti running away already? What the hell, come back, we literally need you. Thankfully, he was just getting an extra run up, and Napoleon and the Jaegermeister stood no chance. With that, the heroes did what they did best. Peter the Penguin exhibiting his expert pirate swordplay. Fruitius Maximus zipping around on his new jetpack, which was ineffective but looked pretty cool. And Barnaby Bear slicing up his foes with his wolverine claws. I'll be honest, Barnaby Bear did do most of the work, like the guy probably could have taken out the entire army on his own, but... Victory was at hand, and with one final jet-powered boost, Fruitius set his sights on the Ductator himself, landing on his rocky platform and then immediately falling off and running out of fuel. Luckily, Peter the Penguin had managed to stay up there and finished him off in a rather unceremonious one-on-one. -on -one. And that's how the battle ended. Their leader no more, the forces of evil were outgunned, and they retreated, at speed, to whatever dark, decrepit corner of the universe they had come from, hopefully never to be seen again. Because of his exploits, Peter the Penguin was named the new King of the Realm, which was a decision he was just as surprised about as everybody else. Considering there weren't many trustworthy creatures left in total, they all went along with it anyway. Peter's first order as king was that he wanted to have a go at surfing on top of the Leviathan, so he and the giant whale left the ceremony early. And, after all the celebrations, more than anything, Stinky and Paul were just glad to be reunited again. As the two of them trotted off into the distance, cheerful and content, I stepped away from my computer screen and finally felt it was time. Time that I closed my antivirus software and my Windows Task Manager tabs and quit Spore, secure in the knowledge that I had done what I set out to do. I, the world's greatest scientist, had found true power. Because sure, I never completed the game properly even one single time, like I didn't even bother with Space Stage once. But I recreated the Battle of Helm's Deep in Spore like I've completed the game. 